<clears throat> okay, any questions before we start? So, final week of class, here we are. So Wednesday night is your video project is due, Wednesday night. So remember, you can look at the syllabus, we talked about it last week. Uh, you can do it on your own, or you can have up to three people of uh, three classmates to come up with your video. Uh, be creative and fun. Um, so anyway, we talked about it last time. Any questions on that? Okay. Um, and then we've got your final in-class exam Friday. And so Tuesday night at 7.30 in the room is uh, JC for the review session. So tomorrow night, 7.30, will be the review session for the final. Yes? Will be recorded? Uh, no. JC's just on his own in here, so if you can try to make it, otherwise it is optional, but uh, you can also try to get the notes from maybe a classmate if you can't make it. Be a good thing. Anybody else? Okay, so... Um, chapter 26 is in a lot of ways an extension of the last chapter we covered on labor. So we're going to uh, kind of continue there. Let's see if I can operate. I'm going to use the screen here, so I was hoping to maybe keep that on. But Javian, if the glare gets too bad, just tell me and I can shut this thing off. But um, we'll see how, how it goes here. Okay, so um, this section talks about earnings differential, which we did talk about a little bit when we brought up uh, the WNBA versus the NBA. So we're going to just explore uh, those issues in Chapter 26 a little bit more. So earnings differentials, productivity, so the labor market. So Chapter 26, why? does pay differ among individuals. <clears throat> so we talked a little bit about this again. Um, so we're just going to run down the list of earning differentials. So, um, you know, the key point here is that we have non-identical workers. I don't know if you guys picked up on this before, but when we cover some of the other stuff we did in the previous chapters, we're basically assuming that all people are identical, right? Remember when I brought up the identical Russ and I had a second Russ and a third Russ? We were kind of holding constant uh, all of those uh, attributes of the workers. And of course, in real life, uh, they're different. So now, we're, now that we're building up our toolbox of economics, um, we're going to relax that assumption and say, well, hey, people really are different, of course. And what's the impact on our models from that? So number one on our list of identical things that we talked about before, worker productivity. People vary in their productivity. So what do we mean by the word productivity? How much you're getting, done, like how much you're getting done at a certain time. OK, good. I like the way you said at a certain time. So there's always. Some, how much work you're getting done for a given amount of some resource. And it could be over the period of time, it could be per worker, it could be per copier, right? If we go back to a copier or something, we could talk about a, a copy machine being product, uh, productive. Here, of course, we're focusing in on, on workers. So worker productivity, you can think of as the number of units of output divided by the number of units of input. So and likely, in our case, it might be uh, you know, uh, hamburgers, number of hamburgers uh, per divided by uh, the number of hours that a particular person works. So they work a four-hour shift, and they make 100 hamburgers. I guess I'm getting, going longer than I anticipated I was going to go. But let's say you kick out 100 hamburgers on a four-hour shift which means you've got 25 hamburgers per hour, right? 
That is your productivity. That's how productive you are, thinking about the formula and what it means for a worker to be productive. Okay, so how does it relate to pay in general? Do more productive workers have more pay or less? More, right? They're more valuable to the firm is what we did in the last chapter. So more productive workers earn higher pay. Why? Because they are more profitable for the firm. That's pretty much what we spent all our time on last week doing is to show um, the reason why companies hire people is to help contribute to the bottom line and if one worker can do 10 hamburgers per hour and another worker can do 25 hamburgers an hour, you can afford to pay the more productive worker a lot more. Okay, any questions or comments there? All right, number two is worker preferences. So workers, workers motivated by monetary uh, rewards are likely to pursue jobs with higher earnings. That would probably certainly be my situation personally. I like money. I've always liked money. Money was very motivational for me. And so very early on, I decided to get into the real estate industry because it looked like that was a spot where I could make some money, right? So that uh, motivated me. Whereas other people might say, I love kids and I want to teach kids. And so they're motivated by the non-monetary benefits perhaps of teaching kids and so they move into the teaching industry, perhaps, where there's lots of kids that they can potentially be close to, right? But it might not pay as much as real estate. Okay, so that's kind of preferences. We're all different in what we're good at and what we, what we think is important to us, and that can shape um, what the labor market looks like in terms of pay as well. Um, okay, number three. Race and gender. <coughs> so discrimination may lower earning opportunities, earnings opportunities of minorities and women. So we'll take a look at that a little closer. And our last one is worker attitude. Worker attitude. So attitudes of honesty, dependability, persistence, dependability, persistence, reliability, trustworthiness, and a 
probability all combine with productivity. impact earnings. <clears throat> so what is employees' attitudes towards work? So there's a real problem <clears throat> over in, uh, this, this, this particular part makes me think of uh, a situation over in like Saudi Arabia and um, Oh, uh, Dubai. Have you guys heard of Dubai, where all the kind of rich oil money's there? Well, it turns out that their kids, your age, aren't interested in work. And so they have a severe labor problem because they don't really have to work. Most of the people in Dubai are all extremely rich, not just even kind of rich or middle income rich, but like extremely rich. And so their attitude towards work is a little different among the, let's just say, 16 to 25 year olds or up to 30 year olds, right? And so that can cause uh, a problem in the labor market as well. Okay, so those are four things that we'll, we'll work with. And now let's kind of think about what happens um, to the demand and supply curve um, as we think about these things. Um, and their impact on the labor market. So, uh, let's say impact on supply and demand. So we'll just kind of take these separately and just draw a demand curve for labor. And this is on your wage over here, or some sort of measure of dollars. Remember, the demand curve is the employer, right? It's the firm, it's the business that's trying to maximize profit. <clears throat> and so what do these things have, worker productivity, <clears throat> let's kind of focus on that one. When workers are more productive, what happens to the demand curve? So for 10 hours of work, let me just pick a, a number over here. So for 10 hours of work, if the workers become more productive, does this thing move kind of to the right and up or to the left and down? Right. Up, right? So at a given level of 10, they would want to hire more. Even at five, they'd want to hire more. And so we have the demand curve shifting up with more productivity. <clears throat> now the supply curve is kind of interesting to unpack as well. So if we have a beginning supply curve, which again is you guys deciding on whether you want to go to work or not, <clears throat> the upward sloping supply curve, as we learned last chapter, just says that as the wage goes up, the opportunity cost of you guys binging Netflix goes up. And so you might just want to go to work, right? As the wage goes up, the opportunity cost of leisure also goes up. And so that would cause you to want to work more. <clears throat> but what happens as you become more productive and more skilled? So to get these skills, to become a productive worker, what do you need to do? Kaylin? Better attitude. Better, better attitude? Part, could be part of it. Do we got some highly paid people with bad attitudes though? Yeah. Yeah, so it's not all attitude. I, I think you're, that would be part of it. Sam? Diversity in the business. What's that? Diversity in the business. Well, I'm not thinking of um, the business itself, but you. So I want you to be thinking about you. How do I raise my, my personal productivity? Not so much the business looking at it. Justice? Experience. Experience, good. I'll give you a hint. Some of you are doing it, all of you are actually doing it right this second. 
What do you need to do to increase skills? Basically. What? Learn. Learn. Yeah. So learning, possibly get a degree, right, from Ottawa University. Is that education free? No. You guys really know that. I saw a lot of head shaking. Hell no, right? So what happens to the supply curve here when there is more productive workers? Does it go up or down in terms of the cost of acquiring it? It goes up, right? So it's costly to make yourself more skilled. So for 10 units of labor, you could be a low, no skill worker, or you could go to college and get a degree. But as you go to college, the supply of those higher skilled people is less than what it was with the lower skilled people. And so that is costly to do. So to acquire skills, so let me just write that down here. S2 <coughs> shows that there are less highly higher, let me put not highly, but higher skilled, higher skilled workers than lower skilled workers. And the reason is that there's a cost because there is a cost to getting skills. Like education. Let's see, Jay, your uh, speaker's not muted. So S2 here shows that there are less higher skilled workers than lower skilled workers because there is a cost to getting these skills, like education. All right, so putting those two things together, we see that the market for labor So the market for skilled labor has higher earnings. So here's kind of the supply and demand with low skill. And supply with the high skill goes up giving us a higher wage and the demand for high skill these people are more productive than others and so we should expect wages to be higher for high skill people, both from the demand side argument and the supply side argument. That's kind of the point with bringing that together. Okay. So, any questions or comments there? So this is right out of your book. Some data that was from, when was this? 2018, it looks like. So this is earnings for men and women, less than high school, high school, some college, bachelor's degree, master's degree, and then professional degree or doctoral degree. And so we see it trucking right along for both men and women. But what do we also notice from this graph? Men get higher wages than women. 
Yeah, men in general are paid higher than women. So is that possibly discrimination issues? Maybe, that's part of what we're gonna investigate, right? So that's what we're gonna, going to look at. Uh, what are the uh, factors that contribute to that? But <clears throat> across the board for both men and women, more education leads to higher earnings. So we do get that connection, right, with, with the um, education attainment. Okay, um, <clears throat> so let's see, I think, we'll go ahead and do a little video to cue that one up. Especially since I have the screen down. So pull out a piece of paper, you'll turn this in for points today. Make sure your first name and last name's on it. <clears throat> so economists uh, have been trying to measure um, wage discrimination for forever. Been on the table for a long time. Maybe not forever, but I mean, economics is still relatively fresh anyway. So. This little video is going to kind of walk us through some of the issues. So you can jot down a couple notes and then at the end of the video, it's just four minutes long, um, I'm just going to have you write a little few uh, reflective statements about it. So it's called, Why Do Women Earn Less Than Men? Another contemporary economic myth is that women make 75 cents for every dollar men make because they're discriminated against in labor markets. Like other myths, this does have a kernel of truth to it. So for example, if you add up all the incomes of women and divide by the number of women in the labor force, and then do the same thing for men, what you'll find is on average, women do make about 75% of what men do. What's happening here is not discrimination in the labor market, but differences in the choices that men and women make about investing in their knowledge, their education, their skills, and their job experience that lead to them getting paid different salaries. Economists talk about people's human capital. By human capital, we mean the knowledge, the skills, the education, and the job experience that people have. And economics argues that people get paid wages according to that human capital. It turns out that men and women invest very differently in their human capital. And we can see that in four different ways. First of all, educational choices. Men, for example, tend to go into fields like engineering. Women tend to go into social sciences, into psychology, into nursing. And so where men are making higher salaries as engineers or perhaps in the business world, women tend to end up in jobs in which their salaries are somewhat lower. So even though they may have the same years of schooling, the different choices they've made about their majors lead to them working in different areas and getting paid differently. Secondly, men and women have different expectations about work. For example, if women expect down the road to take time off to raise children, they'll make different choices today about what kinds of skills they acquire than if they imagine they'll be working full time for the rest of their lives. And we know historically that many women in the 1960s and 70s didn't imagine that they would be working full time at age 40 and ended up making choices that led them to have jobs when they were working at age 40 that didn't pay as well as they might have otherwise. Younger women today, of course, are more likely to imagine themselves working at age 40 and therefore make different investments today. Another difference between men and women is full versus part-time work. Women are much more likely than men to work part-time, men are more likely to work full-time. And part-time work, even for the same kinds of jobs, tends to pay less than full-time work. And women tend to prefer part-time work more than men because women still tend to take on the majority of the responsibility for children. Finally, men and women differ in terms of their tenure on a job or the way in which their careers get interrupted. If it's the case that women take time off from the workforce to raise children, that will have an impact on their salaries down the road. So when we put these four things together, what we get is that the difference between men and women's pay is not a result of labor market discrimination, but of the choices that men and women make before they enter the labor market, or even when they're in the labor market, about the kinds of jobs they want to have and the way they want to balance the family and work. Studies that have tried to control for all these factors have shown that if you take a man and a woman, same experience, same education, same job, and compare their salaries, what you find is that women make about 98% of what men do. So that gender wage gap pretty much disappears. And in some jobs, women actually make more. 
Now, it might well be the case that women are being discriminated against or that sexism is a problem in the choices that women make. For example, girls are guided away from math classes and guided into other kinds of classes. It's also certainly the case that our expectations about women's roles versus caring for children in the household and men's roles about caring for children in the household are very different. And if we think those are poor choices, if we want to see women's pay more equal to men, what we need to do is convince more women to go into areas such as the sciences and mathematics and engineering, and we need to convince men to take more responsibility for children in the house. When those begin to even out, we'll see wages begin to even out as well. But in the meantime, whatever choices men and women make, the wages they're paid in the market will reflect the productivity associated with those choices and are not the result of discrimination. All right, so take a minute or two to write down some things from the video and summarize what you saw. So, Jensen, give me a number between three and seven. Let's go four. Four. One, two, three, four. Robert, you're our lucky winner today. What did you think? What was your thoughts on the video? What'd you write? Okay. So the 75% less than men, um, that kind of got challenged, I think, right? What were some of the things that uh, challenged that? Anna, what did you have? Okay. And there's other studies. I think he's a, uh, th there's, there's multiple studies. He was drawing from one, and it depends on, you know, what sample they looked at and other things. But um, what caused the gap to close, I guess, when we, when we look at the, by the way, the, the 70 cents, 75 cents is reality. If you just take straight gender, men, women, pay, pay, the gap is 70%. But what, what else was brought up as the reasons that it's different? Chris? Uh, the same job never gives no purpose. Okay, same job, so holding some things constant like that. Justice? Uh, women tend to like, go into different career paths. Okay. The career paths was kind of a, a, a big one. Now, could that be because there's other sorts of discrimination that have pigeonholed women to uh, societally to you know be with kids, care for the home, whatever? That's possible, right? So we're not we're not denying that. I wrote STEM up here. You guys have probably heard this going through your high school years. What is a STEM program? What does STEM stand for? It's not totally women, but just in general, engineering is the E. Science, Science technology, technology engineering, engineering math. and math. And yes, there was a, a push to try to uh, encourage um, uh, young females in education to consider stuff like this. Are we doing enough in the program or are there some biases that over time have led uh, one direction or the other and so some of the stem program has been a response to get Everybody kind of equal opportunity to thinking about science technology engineering and math and those are the areas uh, That tend to have the higher pay um, That they referred to and so um, if we look at women engineers 
um, and uh, compare their pay with men engineers, that's where this equalizing factor starts to happen, right? And so holding something's constant, that's, that's really the, the science of trying to figure out, is it discrimination or is it something with worker productivity and worker preferences and other things, right? And so there's, there's ways to kind of try and diagnose that, and that's what, uh, that's what that study was looking to do. Okay, I saw a couple other hands up. Anybody else? Yeah. Women are more likely to work part-time than women. Okay, so we had the part-time, and then he also mentioned culturally, women will still, if you look at the data, tend to stay home more than the men. Is that changing? Yeah. Yeah. My two brothers both stayed home while um, their wives went and worked, uh, at different points anyway. My brother kind of worked from home and that sort of thing. But So culturally, that stuff can shift over time. So when we are, um, let's say, we need change, uh, time to change this gender uh, stuff here. When does, when do people get into their, what I call the prime working years, not what I call, but usually, um, you know, economists and other people who study this stuff. When are you making probably your highest pay of your life? What age do you think? 40s. 40s and 50s, right? So somewhere in there is kind of your, your, what's known to be your prime working years. So now let's do a little math backwards in time. If you are currently 40 years old, just starting the prime working years, when were you born? 1980s, early 80s, right? So that's kind of interesting to think about how long that takes for the data to change, right? So in the 80s, um, was the very start of kind of women entering the labor force. Really, it was the 70s that kind of kicked things off, but you started to see labor force participation rates, which we'll study in macro uh, the next eight weeks, start to really change in the, in the 70s. And so my point with that is that even as that change started, we get to 1980, and we just have new babies being born that are now in 2020 in their prime working years. So, the data to observe whether there has been movement that direction is still yet to come, right? The effects of things that we did back in the 80s, some policy changes in the 90s, some policy changes in the 2000s, uh, doing STEM programs or whatever, those take a while. There's long timing lags uh, to getting maybe some uh, change occurring. Okay. So uh, some interesting food for thought. Um, so let's look at the chapter data, which covers gender and um, other minorities. So as the video did, they kind of did it with a dollar, but it, at uh, holding constant, uh, here's white men, here's white women. And then we've got Black, American Indian, Asian American, Mexican American, and other Hispanic. And so here is part of the actual data on average across the board shows the 76, but adjusted shows 85. So not 98 like that video had, right? So there's lots of different studies, different ways of going about it, different sample sizes. And so uh, there's a lot of people that contribute to this, to this type of um, literature on discrimination in the, in the workforce. And so here, over in, on uh, the female side, these are all women, white women, who has less discrimination, according to the data. Asian American, now what is this all about? 111 and 109? They get paid more. They get paid more. It, from the raw data. So from the raw data, Asian Americans are 109, Asian American males are 109% of white American males. And same thing here with females. So then the adjustment is the other way around with adjusting for factors of education and, and other demographic factors. And so there seems to be pretty good parity here with uh, Asian Americans. Okay, so then this stuff can be monitored over time and we can see if there's a gap that's closing. But it's hard to not say there's 
some form of discrimination in the workforce, right? But it's not as big as the 70%. And there's a lot of other factors. And if you look from industry to industry, you'll see that vary, like in healthcare versus uh, Silicon Valley technology versus engineering. That will vary from sector to sector. Okay, so any questions or comments there? All right, so what does a market with discrimination look like? So a labor market with discrimination. So there's the demand for labor. But if we break apart that demand into the demand for minority labor versus majority labor, or white versus minority, what happens to this demand curve? So this is like, let's say, the average demand like we've been looking at in class. And so now what I want to push you on is to think, well, what does a market with discrimination look like? What happens to the Let's, let's assume discrimination, which we have evidence of, to some degree, varying degrees depending on how it's measured. Where's the demand for males versus females? If this includes males and females, where is the demand for male curve? Above or below? Above, right? And so the mini minority, or the uh, group that's getting discriminated against is below and above. So if we kind of break this average apart, we start to get a picture that looks more like the privileged group versus the discriminated group. So this is the minority, and this is the privileged group. If we mix all the data together, it comes to the middle. But reality might look like this, which then, of course, gives us a pretty easy picture of a wage differential. So there's the supply curve, which we'll just put all people together, uh, minority and majority people. So there's kind of the average supply curve that we've been looking at. Then we would start to observe that the privileged group has higher pay and the minority group has something less. Make sense? We might not like it, but that's just, that's what economics does. It tries to use our toolbox to get a better understanding of maybe some of the problems that exist, which would therefore lead to maybe some different solutions or ways to approach the problem. Okay, um, so let's take a look at <coughs> baseball. How many baseball players do I have in here? I got quite a few, don't I? Okay, I got four, so you don't have to know baseball for this. So you guys know the story of Jackie Robinson? Pretty cool story. Uh, there's a movie and lots of books being written and all that kind of stuff. And so I listened to a presentation, and so most of this was not my original work, um, but I'm presenting what another economist had uh, put together. And so the title is, is says, How Adam Smith Worked with Jackie Robinson, in a sense, uh, to help break the race barrier in baseball. All right, so this is a little bit longer than, it, than, I, than we'll go through in class. I just want to give kind of a quick uh, overview. But as you know, um, we have the Negro Baseball League that was developed because blacks were not allowed in major leagues, right? It was total segregation. Uh, by the major leagues. So we got that going on in this time frame, and this is just quick segregation stuff here. The invisible hand we've been talking about, this is when I give this talk to, to other people, you guys have already heard some of this stuff. All right, so there's the owner uh, of the Dodgers 
And what is he trying to maximize? Profit, right? So we're back to our economic model a little bit. He's trying to maximize profits. Blacks aren't allowed in the league. And what does that mean about potentially winning ball games? What do we need to win ball games? Money is one thing, but that's not going to actually win it for you. Well, we can look at the Yankees, right? They, they've been, uh, uh, they've got the money, so to speak. Um, but what do they use the money for? Good baseball players. Good baseball players. So it's actually the talent that, that's needed to win ball games, right? And so what else makes this guy money? If you're a baseball owner, baseball team owner. What's that? Superstar attraction, absolutely. And so when you have a superstar, what happens to your stadium? It fills, up. it fills up. So they start to quickly learn that superstar attraction and filling up the stadium and which teams fill more stadiums, winning teams or losing teams? Winning. winning teams. And so the key thing to all that is having the best talent out on the field. And so the color green, if you will, was a pretty big attraction to try to muster up some courage to work with Jackie Robinson in breaking down the race barrier. Do we know he wasn't racist? No, we can have, you know, it's, it's his heart. We don't know that uh, bringing Jackie on the team wasn't purely uh, unselfish move and that uh, this was his way of breaking down the race barrier, but the attraction of profits and knowledge about how butts get into seats was a very powerful motivator, regardless of whether he was racist or to what degree he was racist, right? So the market system, the point with all this, and this is, there's other examples of this um, in, over the course of history, is that the market system, the free market, helped to break down the race barrier in Major League Baseball. It wasn't the government coming in to say, you should allow black players on your team. It was the natural incentives created in a capitalist system that brought down the initial barriers in Major League Baseball. And that's a pretty powerful statement. It took the government actually quite a long time to get through the court system of changing the laws. The law of the land was segregation, right? That was the law of the land, and it was broke down through the self-interest of individuals, both Jackie and, and the owner, to, to do that. All right, so da, 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 that's kind of a nice little thing. It's kind of fun to look at a couple things. So there was a couple other players. Satchel Paige was one of the greatest pitchers of all time. By the way, I'm not a, a baseball expert guru. I learned a lot by doing this, uh, this thing. But I wanted to get to uh, a little bit of the stats here. It's kind of interesting. <clears throat> it was, uh, oh, by the way, this, this paper was originally done by Jim Gortney of Ottawa University. So Jim Gortney, I named the Gortney Institute. He's a graduate of Ottawa in 1964. He went on to get his PhD in economics, and this is one of his papers that he wrote. He's uh, pushing, or he's 80, he just turned 80 now. Uh, but he wrote this in 1974, and, and kind of looked at the economics of baseball and the productivity of individual players. He has been a baseball fan his, his, uh, his whole life. And so the, um, some of the interesting things were the teams that uh, broke the barrier the earliest, ended up having more wins sooner. And it was the Yankees who was the only exception to the rule. Because of their money, they could afford to buy highly productive whites to continue on with their discrimination a little bit longer, but it was costly for them, right? So it was costly for the, so this is another lesson that comes out from, from this chapter, is that in the market system, you get disciplined when you discriminate, <coughs> why? Well, the Yankees are a good example of that. In order to keep their discriminatory ways, they had to pay higher pay than what they would have otherwise than what the Dodgers were doing with Jackie Robinson and Satchel Paige. They had to pay more so they didn't make as much money. 
So there was a monetary penalty to uh, being discriminatory. Okay, uh, so then the games won. There's just a lot of interesting things. I won't, won't bore you guys with all this stuff, but um, this was the cool thing in terms of butts and seats. So they estimated that on average, each additional African-American player on a team was associated with between $55,000 and $60,000 of additional home team attendance during the 1950s. And then they go on to say, well, what does the average person who attends a game spend? Right? And then all of a sudden you can start to put together a marginal revenue product curve that we did um, in, our, in our previous chapter. So you can really look at um, the profitability of bringing on uh, new players and having uh, some more exciting games and winning. All right, any questions or comments there? That was a really blow by fast, but hopefully you got the gist of it that um, the market system can actually be a, a powerful way to address some issues in life. Not, it's not gonna solve everything, nothing's perfect, but um, there are examples where, where that has worked. Questions or comments? All right. Um, let's see. Let's let's do another video. Do, 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 do. Sweatshop. This is the one I wanted to do last time. Oh, that's right. I had to. I don't know if I recopied this one. I think this one I need to find a replacement for. Oh, yeah. Okay, this is it. How do you feel about sweat shops? There are a lot of young Americans who want to rid the world of them. They're demanding that rules be passed to improve workers' lives. So who can say, give me a break to that? John, of course. Of course. And I do, Barbara, because rules that, in theory, will make work better, in reality, can make work disappear. <laughs> Last month, there were big protests in Cancun, Mexico, during the meeting of the World Trade Organization. They always protest, wherever this meeting is held. And the protests are being supported by increasing numbers of American students, who say workers are being mistreated. Sweatshops are what they object to most. Factories like this one in Bangladesh, where adolescent girls make sweaters and are paid a fraction of American wages. The protesters seem to be winning the battle of public opinion. In 1996, they made Kathy Lee Gifford cry by saying she was exploiting these young workers in Honduras who made her clothing line. I'm supposed to be personally responsible for everything that happens around the world in Honduras. Yes, say protesters like these. Within weeks, Kathy Lee was admitting the error of her ways. She joined President Clinton at the White House as she renounced the mistakes of her past. That was one glass and one pan too many. The student groups who protest get some funding from labor unions. The Steelworkers Union lets one group use part of their offices in Washington, D.C. Maybe that's why the protesting students are also upset about wages in America. This group wants to go over the office of Harvard's president and held it for three weeks, demanding higher wages for workers at the school. Their supporters camped outside, and even big-time actors, Matt Damon and Ben Affleck, showed up to give their support. <laughs> Senator Ted Kennedy came out and shook the students' hand. One of the leaders of this protest was Ben McKean. He assembled this group of student leaders to tell us what they're upset about. The workers themselves have come to us and said, you benefit from our exploitation, give us back some. And if we can tell the corporations that we don't want to buy products that are being made by people that they're able to exploit, then we can really help to end some of the serious problems affecting these people's lives. Oh, that sounds very nice, except when we talk to some people who live in the places where the workers are supposedly being exploited in sweatshops, we heard a different story. I wish these people would begin to think with their brains rather than with their hearts. 
to Beck De Broy, an economist who lives in India. We interviewed him and his other supporters of globalization as they were on their way to Cancun. I don't understand the expression sweat shoes. There's nothing wrong with sweat. Sweat is good. Sweat is what most people in the developing world, including India, do all the time. People get jobs in these places, then their generation lives better than their parents lived. Chunarunga studies trade policy. She lives in Kenya. Doesn't the United States have a responsibility to stop these companies from exploiting people in your country? Exploiting people? Nobody in my country thinks about companies exploiting them. When there's a new company opening a factory, people are excited about it. Arunga and De Broy point out that in poor countries, the Nike factories that well-fed American students call sweatshops routinely pay twice what local factories pay and more than triple what people earn doing much harder and more dangerous work in the field. I wish we would have more sweatshops, quote unquote, in my country. Most economists say what many Americans call sweatshops are what allow people in now thriving places like South Korea, Taiwan, and Hong Kong to pull themselves out of poverty. People started in the sweatshops, but then they moved on to better jobs. Most of them work for these companies for a while, go off and start their own businesses. It's a win-win situation for everyone. And that, she says, is why the students who protest are ignorant and clueless. We don't want our clothes made in sweatshops. They have no idea what they're talking about. It's sweatshops right away. And they're comparing that to what they have in their rich homes. They call people like you ignorant and clueless. <laughs> rich. Ignorant and clueless. The image that we have as being rich and clueless and, and just idealist college students is a false one. Do I have a vision of how I want the world to, to be? Sure, of course I do. I want the world to be one where people don't have to struggle to feed their children. The workers are forced to migrate into the city or into places where factories like these exist. Who's forcing them? They travel to the factory. They choose to work there. I mean, you would prefer eating to not eating. Sure, but if you insist on higher wages, some of these factories will close. You're going to put people on work. We're not trying to close down sweatshops. We're trying to yes, change sweatshops. I mean, you say they're not, but that's the result of your protest. Some places will close. They'll go where the wages are lower. The goal is to raise the wages across the board. The protesters say that they don't want to take away the jobs. They just want to make them better. By passing laws trying to improve the jobs by force, they will get rid of the jobs. <laughs> After the protests against Kathy Lee's clothing line, Walmart withdrew its Kathy Lee contract from a New York factory, taking work away from these workers. American complaints about child labor persuaded factories in Bangladesh to stop hiring adolescents. The result, according to UNICEF, is that many of the young girls turn to prostitution instead. These protests help poor people? Give me a break. All right, give your reflecting thoughts and we'll discuss. I'll randomly pick one of yours to share, one of you to share. So write down your thoughts. <clears throat> 